tomato ketchup. What other kind of ketchup is there? Ketchup, or catsup, or catsip, or ketchup, or ketchup, or ketsup, was originally good job, a Hokkien word for a sauce made of salted and fermented fish. Dutch and English sailors fell in love with this savory sauce that could last long voyages, and they brought it over to Europe in the 1600s. Only problem? They didn't know how to make it. So they replaced fish with local alternatives. From mushrooms, to oysters, to grapes, to walnuts, to egg whites, to stale beer, they tried anything. Tomato ketchup wouldn't even come along for another 200 years. Many thought these new world plants were poisonous. Once tomato ketchup did become a thing, they had a bad reputation for poor quality control and harmful preservatives. It wasn't until Henry Hines developed his iconic, shelf-stable, preservative-free recipe in 1904 that tomato became the ketchup to rule them all. But why do we just completely forget about all the other ketchups? Look ketchup up in the dictionary and you wouldn't even know there was anything other than tomato. Were these ketchups so bad that we decided to never speak of them again? I also noticed all these base ingredients, from tomatoes to walnuts, have one thing in common. Notable amounts of glutamic acid, better known by its salt form, MSG, the compound behind the umami flavor of foods. Which makes sense if you're trying to replicate a fish sauce. But then the natural question is, where's the seaweed? The concept of umami literally came from seaweed. Kombu has one of the highest concentrations of glutamic acid you can find. How is there no seaweed ketchup? I'm about to embark on a month-long journey where I make a bunch of these ketchups to see if they deserve to be remembered. And I'm also going to try to create seaweed ketchup. Let's do this. And you know we can't start this journey without the classic. Blue jeans, red-blooded, all-American... The immediate difference is the consistency. I mean, I just can't beat the smooth, goopy texture of Heinz. The homemade version just didn't stick to my fries in the same way. Although, the more I compare the two, the goopy texture of Heinz is starting to feel... kinda creepy? I don't know. Immediately, the homemade version has a more intense aroma of tomato and spices. I never noticed just how little Heinz tastes like tomato. The first note you get is sweet, then refreshing brightness from the vinegar, and then there's a faint aftertaste of tomato. It makes sense, as Heinz had to seriously up the sugar, salt, and vinegar content to create a preservative-free ketchup. The homemade will last about a month, but Heinz will last over a year. Overall, it's hard to say which one I like best. I love how much is going on in the homemade version, but it just can't beat the nostalgia factor and texture of Heinz. But it was cool to try the tomato ketchup everyone used to make at home before Heinz. Next up, we look across the ponds to the former most popular ketchup, and once iconic British condiment.
Mushroom ketchup was often paired with meats, stews, and gravies. But I want to test its umami powers on less savory foods. Whoa. My immediate thought is, I can't believe how much this tastes like soy sauce. But once you get past the saltiness and tanginess, the distinctive mushroom flavor really comes through. It adds an amazing, concentrated savoriness to the potatoes and carrots, and a brightness to the grilled cheese I really love. It's like a more versatile soy sauce, as I could definitely eat this with some soba noodles or dumplings. I mean, my mind's just racing with all the ways you could use this. The runniness does make me appreciate how tomato ketchup doesn't make things wet. This is an authentic recipe, but you could add xanthan gum, or maybe even blend the leftover mushrooms in the sauce to thicken it. So how is this just not a thing anymore? Like seriously, does someone have an explanation? Anyway, let's move on to the ketchup I'm most intrigued by, walnut. But it actually requires unripe green walnuts. Unripe walnuts are soft and have some juice. That juice and the soft husk have a distinct flavor that gets extracted when pickled. Unripe walnuts are available during a short window in the summer, but I won't be deterred. Just like the Europeans who couldn't make fish ketchup, I'm just gonna experiment with what I have and see what comes of it. This could be a completely fruitless exercise, but I present to you a very wrong version of the ketchup most famous for being Jane Austen's favorite condiment. Now we move on to the newest member of the ketchup family, banana. When the Philippines ran out of tomatoes in World War II, food scientist Maria Orosa invented a new and much beloved ketchup out of local ingredients like bananas and chili peppers. She's actually kind of an icon. She dedicated her life to making the Philippines more self-sufficient by inventing over 700 recipes using native foods and byproducts. Her inventions include soyalak and darak, nutrient-dense foods that saved thousands of lives during food shortages. She smuggled food into Japanese-run internment camps and joined the Filipino freedom fighters. And when everyone urged her to flee Manila, she refused to leave her post and lost her life feeding those in need. I can't do her story justice in this video, but what I can do is make her most beloved creation.
I'll be honest, I'm not proud of that banana ketchup. It was kind of lumpy, too runny, and I accidentally peeled the Saba bananas before boiling them. But in my defense, I almost missed a flight making ketchup, which has me reevaluating my priorities lately. Anyway, I tried again later, this time with Cavendish bananas. I didn't have a food scale, so I just went off taste. I ended up adding way less sugar and vinegar, creating a more banana-y ketchup. The original recipe calls for equal parts sugar and bananas, and a ton of vinegar, so it's really sweet and tangy, and didn't actually taste that much like banana. But hey, that's exactly what Heinz tastes like, so mission accomplished. I decide to use my ketchup in its most iconic dish, Filipino spaghetti. Your eyes are not deceiving you, this is a sweet spaghetti made with banana ketchup, plus more sugar, topped with hot dogs and cheddar cheese. And it actually tastes all right. Cheddar on spaghetti totally works. I mean, I don't think sweet spaghetti is my thing, but this dish also doesn't have the nostalgia for me that it does for its many fans. I, as a kid, would have gone crazy for this. My favorite part about this ketchup, though, is how it's a reminder of the power of food, and how sometimes the foods we find the strangest have the most incredible stories of adversity and human ingenuity. And uh, speaking of ingenuity, the moment of culinary brilliance you've all been waiting for. In conclusion, all of these ketchups are great, except for walnut. Sorry I did you dirty. And this whole exercise makes you wonder, what other amazing dishes have we simply lost to time? No hate on Heinz, but it came at the cost of this wonderful diversity of savory sauces, along with the loss of this fun art of home experimentation that the original ketchup kicked off hundreds of years ago. I really wish I could have made grape, oyster, and stale beer ketchup, but I honestly need a mental health break from ketchup right now. But maybe in a part two? Thanks for watching.